Hi everyone, my name is Feline Hermans. I'm assistant professor at Delft University of Technology. Some of you know me maybe by my spreadsheet fame. I've done some research on spreadsheets. Quick summary, I built something like NUnit and ReSharper for Excel. But that is not what this talk is about. So if you came here to listen to me talk about spreadsheets, that, that's not what it's about. This talk is about... Mic is not perfect, yes. Yeah, that's better. This talk is about my, my very rich social life that uh, one day brought me to play the game board game of Quarto. So Quarto is a board game, it's a bit like four in a row, but normal four in a row, the pieces have two dimensions. So they are white and black, sometimes they are yellow and red, but they just have two properties that distinguish them. However, in Quarto, as you can see here a little bit, the pieces have four properties. So they can be white or black, they can be round or square, they can be long or short, and they can have a dent, like this one, a dent in the top, or they don't have it. The, the basics of the game is still similar to four in a row. As players, you have to get four in a row of one of the properties. So either four whites, four blacks, four short ones, or four round ones. Sorry? Yeah, so a, a line, uh, so it's... Uh, a row or a column or a diagonal, but not in a not in a square. Uh, oh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. So that's not uh, that's not the variant that we played. At least we only had the ones with uh, where rows and where rows and columns counted. That's a nice addition, though. I should I can fix that probably in my code. So I played a few games with my boyfriend, but in all of the games that we played, either one of us won. So we started wondering after a while. Could it be that this game ends in a tie? Is, is this a possibility? So I imagine that in normal people households, it would be something like this. Ah, oh, I don't know, I don't care, the end. <laughs> However, of course, if you live in a nerd hole household like I do, we were like, let's figure this out. We shoved the board game aside and we took out our laptops and we thought, okay, let's actually do some science, let's, let's see if we can do this. So an obvious thing that you could do, of course, is you could brute force this. If you look at the board, it's not that big, it has set only 16 fields, so you could think, okay, let's brute force this. But if you think about this a little bit, it's actually not that pleasant. So the first one, you have 16 possibilities, of course, to, to put a, a piece on the board, and then 15 and 14, et cetera, and, and this gets out of hand pretty quickly. This actually amounts to 16 faculty, which is that number that, that's pretty big. And for each of the assignments, so if you have all the fields on the board, you have to make 160 checks because you have to check all rows and all columns and the diagonals. And for each of them, you have to, that those are 10, and for each of them you have to make 16 checks to see if, if one of the properties is the same. So suppose you have this machine here, it has four core, cores of 2.6 gigahertz, so theoretically you could do 10 billion operations a second, that would still be 320,000 seconds, which is about 90 hours. So that's a bit long for a board game night. That's, that's not the approach that we want. And also, of course, it would be pretty boring to just write 10 for loops, leave your machine in the, in the table and go to sleep. That, that would be a, a very short talk. So this problem is not actually yet solved. And then, of course, I remembered at one point, somewhere uh, long ago, I went to university and they taught me something about how to address these types of problems. And I had a course called Automated Reasoning that taught me all sorts of techniques, how you can use computer science to address these type of problems exactly. So I thought, Let's, let's use that, let's use my knowledge, let's science the shit out of this. We will use set solving to see if this b game can actually end in a time. So the idea of this problem transformation is something like this. So instead of taking the original problem and going right to the solution, we are taking our original problem, representing it in an alternative way, solve it in that alternative world, and then go back to the solution. So this might sound a little bit abstract to you, so let's look at an example. So what we could do, for example, if we want to divide a number 78,974, if we want to divide that by two, we could divide, divide it by two directly, of course, we start here, 
we do lots of steps, and then we get to a division by two. This is a possibility. However, what I could also do is I could represent this problem in an alternative way, for example, in binary numbers. And now, if I have to divide a number by two in the binary world, who knows how to super quickly do that? <laughs> yes, just bit shift. So you just er erase the final zero, and you've divided by two. So that's once you have your number in that nice binary world, some operations are very easy. And then, of course, there's one more step. If we want to have the answer in a decimal world where we started, we have to transform it back. This is exactly what I'm going to do with the quarto problem as well. I take the problem, I represent it in something else, and I solve it there. So what exactly is that something else? I take quarto and I'm going to transform this into Boolean satisfiability. Because I know if I have it in Boolean satisfiability, it will be easier for me to solve it. And I will explain both these things, why it's easier to solve, and what exactly is satisfiability. I will get right through that. So what is satisfiability? Satisfiability starts with Boolean logic. So Boolean logic is a language in which you can express nice little properties. So for example, you could say, do you want coffee or tea? And that looks like this, coffee or tea. And those propositions can be true or false. So someone can say, this is true, coffee or tea, yes, that's true. Another proposition is something with and. Do you want coffee and tea? That looks like this, coffee and tea. And that too can be false or true. And if it's false, we put this little sign before it. That's a negation, a not. In many programming languages, this is an, <coughs> an exclamation mark. Sometimes it's a tilde. But in Boolean proposition, you, you write this little hook. And you can do derivations based on Proposition. So you can say, so you want coffee? No, no coffee. Based on this, we can actually conclude something. Coffee or tea is true. Not coffee and tea is true. Not coffee is true. So we can deduce tea from that. And all these images, I didn't draw them, they're actually from this super wonderful graphic novel book about the history of Lovelets and Babbage. I can really uh, recommend reading it. It's, it's very wonderful. So once you have these propositions, you can do some calculation. And that's exactly what satisfiability is. The idea of satisfiability is you have such a Boolean proposition, P or non Q, and an SAT solver is going to find a truth assignment. So it's going to find Boolean values for those variables in such a way that the whole proposition is true. So for P or non Q, for example, you could say P is true, and Q is false, then non-Q is true, so this is super true. True or true is, is very, very true. So the good news is there are wonderful tools for this. I already imagine, uh, med mentioned them. SAT solvers are very quick at that. So how they work is you give them an input, some sort of proposition, and they tell you, yes, it's satisfiable, or no, it's not satisfiable. And typically, they also give you a truth assignment. So they also say, yes, it's satisfiable, namely with these values for all the variables. The bad news is it's not really simpler. We haven't made our problem simpler. If you know what it means, this problem is still NP-hard. And if you don't know what that means, that means it's very, very, very hard. So we've not made our problem secretly simpler. We've just represented it in a way for which we know there are lots of tools. Every year, there is an SAT solving competition to which many academics submit their programs and they compete with each other. And this is what actually makes them better, that there's lots of research done into how they work. And later in my talk, I will show you a few of the tricks that makes the, make these SAT solvers so efficient. So the idea is, let's not forget about what we were doing. We were working on Quarto, the board game. So the idea is we're going to express the whole state of the game, how exactly a tie looks like in Booleans. And then we can ask an SAT solver, here's how a tie looks like. Find me one. Is this possible? So what we're going to do is we're going to represent every field in our board with four Booleans. And each of the Booleans, you can probably guess this, is going to represent one of the properties. So I'm going to express whatever is on that field, the, the piece that will be on that field, with four variables for 
the four properties, black and white, long and short, square and round, and flat, or a hole in the top. So if I have this assignment, this is how I'm going to define my variables, we can express a tie like this. There's no row or column or diagonal, or in your variant, a square, where four properties are the same. So for all properties P, for all combinations S, rows, column, and diagonals, it cannot be the case that the stones in S all have the same property. So for example, that looks like this, for property zero in the first row, you're going to say not this, all these properties are equal to each other. One more thing that I should also express though, is all the stones on the field should be different. This is how a quarto set looks like. There are 16 pieces and they all have different configurations. It would be not a real tie if I would go to the toy store, buy a second set of quarto and make a tie with pieces from two sets or more sets. So I have to express as well that all of the stones should be different. AKA, no two stones may be the same. So I can do that like that. For every combination of two fields, for example, 0, 0, and 0, 1, they're not exactly the same. So it should not be the case that all the four properties are the same, because if all the four properties are the same, those two pieces are the same, and that means I'm playing with two different quarto stones sets. Of course, you can imagine these are lots of rules. They look very simple on the slides, but I have to type them for all combinations, for all properties, for all duos or fields. Of course, I'm not going to type all of this. I'm going to write a little script that's going to generate the input file for my SAT solver. I'm going to generate the input file, of course, if I use an SAT solver. Okay, so you could say the problem is solved. Look at that, we have a nice little for loop. We generate the rules for the rows, the rules for the columns, the rules for the diagonals, and I also add the rules for not all is the same. So this generates all the rules, and I have all my input. So you might be wondering now, of course I told you SAT solvers are really quick, you can believe me, but I know I ex expect some skepticism from the audience. How is this actually better? Now that we have converted our problem into SAT, why is it actually better? So let's look a little bit at how SAT solvers work, work on the inside. You give them a proposition, and, and then what? what? What do they do? So, simply said, they just try all options. As I said, the problem is MP-hard, so there's basically nothing else you can do than try all options that are there. So how does trying all options look like? You start, for example, for the proposition P or Q and non R, with 0, 0, 0, you put it in, it's 0, 0, 1, sadly that's false, and you repeat it until you get a truth value. That is the basic idea. However, we're not, of course, just going to try all input files, all input options, because then we're just doing the brute force attack and we already know that that is going to take 90 hours. So there are some smarter things that SAD, SAT solvers do while still, as a basic idea, trying all options. So there's this one little trick that SAT solvers hate because it greatly reduces state space. What they do is called unit resolution. Unit resolution is the idea that if you have P or non-Q and Q, this is equi-satisfiable to P, just as satisfiable. If I can satisfy this, then I can also satisfy that. So why is that? If you look, look at how this proposition looks like, it's P or Q and Q, uh, P or non-Q, I'm sorry, and Q. So for something with an N in the middle to be true, both sides, need to be true. Otherwise, you know, we're failing anyway. So we know that this Q must be true because it's in the top of an end. If that is true, then this is false. This side also needs to be true because it's something and something. So that the only solution we can still get is from the P also to be true. So Q is true, must be true. That means non-Q must be false, 
and that means we have to get the true value from P. This is called unit resolution, and it can greatly re reduce the state space. And of course, this proof that I just gave is, as we professionals call it, a proof by hand waving. But you can actually prove this for the general case. So if you want to do some interesting stuff in the next break, you can prove the general case of unit resolution. And the last time I give this talk, actually someone tweeted me a proof after the talk, like he hand wrote a proof on paper and sent me a picture of it. So, I mean, I'm expecting something of Poland as well. It would be nice to, uh, to get a proof. So how does unit resolution actually look like on an SAT example? That might help you a little bit to, to get a feel for it too. So here is a Boolean proposition, and I've written it down in something like a special way. So if you look at it, it looks exactly like the example I just showed you. All of these are ors. And they're all combined by ands. This is how the SAT solvers use them too. So that means it's very easy to read it in this format. On every row, we have to get a truth value because all of them are connected by ands. So on every row, something has to be true or the whole exercise is going to fail. So how do we start? As I said, we simply try all options. So we start with what we can we do? just the first variable that we have in the first row, p. And let's say it's true, why not? So that means p is true, and then we know that non-p is false automatically. That's, that's what we already know. And now here we can do unit resolution on the third clause, because non-p or non-s has to be true, because it's one of those end connections. Sadly, non-p has found to be false, so we have to get the truth value, have to get it from non-s, because otherwise we fail. So we're going to say non-s must be true. And then we can propagate that value, so we know that, then that s is false. Now, unfortunately, we cannot do unit propagation anywhere, because there's no clause where everything but one is false. So we don't know what to do. We just go back, fall back to our original strategy of trying all options. So let's say Q is true. Oh, why not? Just the next one alphabetically. We say Q is true, non-Q is false. And that means again now we can do unit resolution on the fourth clause because all these guys, all these friends, they're all false. So the only way we can still save this almost sinking ship is to make R true. We have to do that, otherwise we fail. So we make R true, ta-da, and we have a truth assignment where in all of the rows, as you can see it visually now, why this is such a nice representation, on all of the rows we have a green dot, and that is our assignment. So you can see that we had four variables, but only two of them we had to do state space exploration on. We have to, had to pick a value because the other ones were just derived. So you can see how this greatly reduces state space by not just trying all the options, but see if I try this, then what are the conclusions of that? And then you don't have to try any other options. You don't have to try, for example, different values for S. That, that those are options we didn't have to even try because we could deduce them. So you could say if you're paying, paying attention, or maybe if you've seen things like this before, yes, but that was a very nice example, miss. This was a perfect state where nothing went wrong. What happens if things go wrong? Well, I'll show you what happens if, while doing unit re resolution, you run into a problem. So let's look at this. We take our same strategy, we set P to true, and we set then all the non-Ps, they will be false. So now we can do unit resolution here on two and four. However, that's of course going to result in a conflict, a problem, because if we set this S to false, then that fourth clause is false or false, which is very false. And that means the whole thing is not going to work anymore because it's something, something, something and false and something else, and that will never be true. So unfortunately, we have run into a conflict that is much false, very sad. So what do we do now? What we do is we flip the th last thing that we assigned. So not the S that was derived with unit resolution, but the last, the last choice we made, which is the P. We simply say, OK, so something went wrong. This P is true is obviously not the good thing to do. So we just flip it. We say P is false, let's try again, let's start in this new situation, and the, then the rest continues. So that's what happens in a 
conflict situation. Apart from unit resolution, there's one other super, super smart trick that SAT solvers use to make the situation quicker, and that is called watches. So what watches do is they make the execution of unit resolution quicker. If we go again to this statement, it's very easy to see where we can do unit resolution because we only have four variables and five lists of clauses. So it's very easy. But suppose, and you will see that later on, I have not forgot about my board game. If we go to what I generated for my board game, you'll see that there are thousands of variables and thousands of clauses. And for more realistic, real life situations, those lists can be even longer, thousands and thousands of clauses. So you can imagine that every run of your algorithm, you're going to have to check where can I do unit resolution. That gets expensive to do that all the time. And this is where watches come in. So reminder again, we can only use unit resolution if all of the clauses but one are unassigned. If I have red dots everywhere and one white dot, one variable that doesn't have a dot yet, that's where I can do unit resolution. Only in that situation. As long as I have two unassigned variable, I'm not going to resolve anything because I don't know where the story will end. So suppose I would have a system for each of the clauses to point at two unassigned variables I would know there's no way I can do unit resolution if there are still two unassigned variables. I can only do it if one variable is unassigned. And that is exactly what watches do. So what watches do is, let's make them purple dots. In all of the clauses, I make two variables purple. Those are the ones that I am watching, the ones that I'm looking at. While there still are two watches, I don't have to do anything. I don't have to inspect that clause because there won't be unit resolution possible. So that is the watches. They are watching unassigned variables. That's what they do. So we can just start by the same strategy we start by exploring the variables. We just pick the first two variables. Why not? So we just watch two things, not all the things. Great optimization. We just start with two variables per clause. Doesn't really matter which ones we pick. If that's not possible, like in these two, two and four, I cannot pick two unassigned variables because there are none. Well, in that case, we know we can do unit resolution. So we do a truth assignment, and that means these two watches will have to move because they are now assigned variables. So I move them here, and I move that one there, and then I can continue my algorithm. And the really, so these are now the watches. And the really, really, really smart thing is, maybe you've noticed if you were paying very close attention, this is what makes watches so super brilliant, not the fact that they're watching two variables. If we have a conflict, like we have now here, we have a conflict, again, very sad, much false, we can just remove the assignment as we did before, we flip P, but we can leave the watches where they are. We don't have to do anything to the watches if we backtrack. Because, by definition, they're watching unassigned variables. And if we're backtracking, we're only changing the value of variables that have already been assigned to. So if we backtrack, and you can imagine that in lots of clauses and lots of variables, it does happen a lot that you run into a conflict, we don't have to update these watches. So that's a very efficient situation. The fewer things we have to do in a conflict situation, the better. Now we only have to swip, swap assigned variables. So this is a relatively new invention that really helped improve the efficiency of SAT solvers. So, Problem solved. I've shown you how I'm going to generate the input files, and I give you a little sneak peek of how SAT solvers work in the back. So that means our, our problem is solved now, right? The talk should almost be over because we have generated everything. However, one more thing. If you look at these rules, they don't really look like the thing I just showed all the SAT solving examples on. For one thing, they have equal signs in the middle. They have negations in the top. They don't look like everything with an and combines everything with an or. So unfortunately, our problem is not yet solved. 
we have to make sure that our input rows, rules, are generated in such a way that they are the CNF format, conjunctive normal form. That's what I just showed the SAT examples on. So that's, we should have something like that and not, not something like that. Only CNF, your format, you're able to put into an SAT solver. So, sadly, we're, we're still not done. We have to do a little bit more. So what I did is I wrote a little library in F Sharp that in which I could express the variables and all the rules that would make it a lot easier for me to quickly rewrite, rewrite rules. So I made this a variable, a not, an and, and an or, and true or false. And I also made an equality, because as you saw in the rules that I'm generating, I also need an equality sign. This property has to be equal to that property. And I didn't include it in my little DSL. I just said, if you, you can write equal, but then it would just generate a term for you with an and or. That makes it a bit easier to do all the rewrite rules. So what I can do then, the, the trick to get any Boolean satisfiability into CNF is you apply lots of rules. So for example, n, a, and true is equal to a. These are just basic Boolean equ equivalencies rules. And then what we do is we use the Morgan and distribution. So the Morgan is taking nots and re removing them. So if we have not not a, it's a. And have do if we have nots on the outside, we push them in. Because as you saw in the CNF format, the nots only occurred right in front of variables. So we have to take all the nots in the, in the beginning and push them all the way down to the variables. And what we also cannot have is ors in the beginning. We can only have ands in the beginning and the ors also have to be in the belly of the expression. So we take distribution. If there are ors, we push them in into an and. And this, we re repeat this process all the way until nothing changes anymore, until we're at a fixed point situation. So we apply these rules over and over again, all the knots in the middle, all the ors in the middle. If you repeat that, you will guarantee always end up with something that is CNF. This is on GitHub, by the way. So if you ever find yourself in a situation where you have to do some Boolean rewriting, you think it, it will also be at the final slide, so you don't necessarily have to take a picture now. So if you want to use this library, then then you can do so, you don't have to do all this work yourself for your favorite board game or other situation you would need that. So this, this is how it actually looks like. You can define a nice term in a language that is somewhat nice. So you can say or not equal a, b, not equal b, c. This is what it makes of it because it already rewrites the equals. Oops. This is what it uh, rewrites to, so it already rewrites the equals. I don't know why I have this slide now. Okay, I will talk about this then. One other thing that we still need for the input file is it cannot just eat CNF. It has to be in a very, very special format called Dmax. So all the variables need to be numbers, and they have to have a negation sign before them. So what I also still needed to do is normalize it and then print it into the specific string format, I will show you in a bit, that SAT solvers need. So they don't just eat this, they need this. So the variables are numbers and all these things are clauses as, as we just had them. So every variable is represented by a number. If it's a negation of a variable, you put a minus sign before it. It has to start with P, C, and F, and then the number of variables and the number of clauses. And, and here's the even stranger thing. Every line has to end with a zero and a line break. Because obviously a normal line break is not going to cut it. It has to be a zero and then a line break. And then it has to look exactly like this, or the SAT solvers won't do it. So they're, they're a little bit like, like divas, like rock stars. They can solve MP hard problems really quickly, but they're not going to do a little bit of string manipulation for you. So you have to feed it exactly right to them, or it won't work. So what you can do with my library is, you can make, the, that's what it's called, the DMAX format. You can make the DMAX format, and it nicely prints out exactly what you need to feed into the solver. 
So now our problem is really almost solved. So I wrote the C sharp, I transformed it with F sharp, and this is now what I get. So I go to Minisat, which is one of the SAT solvers. There are, there are lots of them. It doesn't really matter which one you pick. They all have their pros and cons. So you go to Minisat, and you can input the input file right there. So look, look at me. Here I'm going. It's a little video of me typing. There we go. Ta -ta -ta -ta. Bam! Look at, the, look at how quick that was. There was like no video editing involved. Just because it's so cool. Let me, let me show you once more. <laughs> it's so quick. I mean, if you, if you blink, you miss it. <laughs> da, 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 da. Bam! So we're going from 89 hours of brute forcing into just a few seconds of calculation because of all the tricks that I showed you that make it so much quicker. So I was like, yeah, that was awesome. Yay for science. I did it. Really, really cool. So we're, we're almost there, of course. We're still not done yet. I, well, how much time? I, I still have 15 minutes. So what we still need to do, of course, we are now here. We have a solution in our SAT world, but not yet in, in a real life setting. So we know it can end in a tie, but how does it look like? And of course, I wanted to see it on the actual board, because you never know, maybe you've made a mistake in encoding or in thing. I want to see the real thing. So you can ask Minisat as well to give you an assignment. Equally quickly, and then you get this. Like the input format, the output format is nicely readable for anyone with a heart. Like it's nice for machines. So this is the whole assignment, that the, all the variables, and if they have a, a minus before them, they're false, and otherwise they're true. And actually, this is all false because these are all not real variables. I started my variables somewhere at 7,000, and then you still get all these variables. So this is the, this the, the real assignment right here. So you see some are true and, and some are false. So by then, I was a bit... Uh, bored with programming, I didn't want to write a parser that parses the input, uh, the output back. So I just took a sheet of paper, made a mapping of all my variables, and there you see, ta-da, it's a tie in Quarto. So here you see all my variables, and I just wrote them. So this is how a tie looks like. Of course, the next question is, how many ties are there? And what would, do we have to count rotations and mirroring? and? So that adds for a for a next talk. So as I said, all of this uh, all of the, this code is on uh, on GitHub. And in the meantime, after I made this slide, I've actually made a little parser that parses the output back. So what you can do now, if you go to the GitHub pages, you can actually type some a nice term, and then you can say run it, and then it runs it, and it parses the output back. So you really get a true and b false. So that's that's even nicer than than is in my uh, advertised in my slides. So you might wonder why am I listening to a talk on board games for half an hour? That is not very useful. So I will take another few minutes to talk about a few real life applications of SIT solvers. Of course, board games are real and live, but more, more useful real applications. So one of the things that you can also use SAT solvers for that you're a bit more likely to run into in your daily job is you have to divide people in groups. So, for example, you have to divide people in shifts or students in groups or uh, sports groups over a sports roster. So, sometimes, often, there are constraints as well. So, I have these people and B wants to be in a group with A and with E, but not with C and C and D also. Uh, it won't be well if they go in a group together. So what you can do is you can give everyone a bit. Suppose we want to have them in two groups, we just give them one bit each. Each get one bit, and then we can just express, make an assignment for the Booleans in such a way that those guys get the same bit, but those guys do not get the same bit. And then you ask an SAT software to give you an assignment, and we'll make an assignment for you. And of course, this you can also do it for two bits or three bits if you need more groups. So that's really relatively easy to express, and it will be very, very quick. And this easily generates to planning and scheduling. There are even scientific papers really 
that use SAT solving efficiently to make basketball playing roster. So th there are real applications, and these type of things are otherwise, maybe you've written a scheduling algorithm before, they are pretty hard to do manually because you can run into those conflicts and you have to start swapping things. So solvers are a pretty good solution there. Another real life example of SAT solving is testing and especially hardware testing. So suppose I have a specification robot that takes A and B and it takes the minimum. And I say, here's the specification. So it's zero, zero is zero, zero, one is zero, one, zero is zero, and one, one is one. And I also have an implementation robot. That is, if A is B or non-B, then A, else B. Is this a correct implementation of that specification? You can use SAT solving as well, because you can say for any given input, I run it through this one, and I run it through that one. And you can, of course, do again all those transformations on the rules inside them. And you can see if they're equal. And typically, this is done over a finite set of inputs. So you just take, here are all the inputs I can get. And for all of them, you're going to calculate if they do exactly the same thing. And this is actually used in, as I said, in testing, specifically in hardware testing, where people test circuits, circuits and they want to know if they're exactly the same. So if, once you can express the Boolean logic of them, you can calculate if they're the same. But it's also used for DNA sequencing. So you, you, there are properties you can express a certain type of molecule with, and then you can calculate if they're the same. So that's more or less everything I wanted to talk about before we go to questions, because I do think we have some time. I will summarize my entire talk in one minute. So if you come, came in late or if you were a bit uh, suffering from post-lunch sleepiness, this is your, your second chance to get all of it. And of course, if you have been paying attention the whole time, this is optimal preparation for question asking. So I wanted to know whether the board game of Quarto could end in a tie. You could do this brute force, but first of all, that's very slow. And secondly, that would make a very short, boring talk. So I decided to do something more cool involving science. I used an SAT solver to fix it. And I explained to you a little bit how those things work. They use unit resolution and they use watches to greatly speed up execution. I wrote a little library in F Sharp that you can use to express such Boolean propositions and in the newer version that's now online, you can even run mini shots in the back and get the output parsed right in front of you. I still got the output in this horrible format, but I parsed it back myself and I found indeed there is a tie. And there are real life applications of SAT as well, including scheduling, matchmaking, testing and DNA sequencing. That's it. That was my talk. Any questions? Yes. Uh, what are some properties of a problem that I know that I can make it to a set solver? That's a very good question. So what, what are properties of problems that you can map to SAT solving? It, it takes some practice, I guess. If I see a problem, I think uh, that's nice. So ma mapping things to integers. That's often something that you need. You want to give you want to give everything a number, and then numbers are bits or booleans, and then you're there. So if you can express something, you can give anything a number, and the things you want to express is, this should not be that, then that's probably it. But there are a, a few nice uh, books, or you, uh, if you Google, if you go to the websites of SAT solvers, you will see a few examples, which is probably the best way to get a feel for it, to try it a bunch of times. And in addition to SAT solvers, there are also things that are called constraint solvers. And they're in the back, they, in, in the, they still do very similar things. But constraint solvers can also do things like this should be bigger than that. So you, you don't necessarily have to talk about bits anymore. You can just say, I really have two integers. This one has to be bigger than that one. And this one has to be equal to the sum of those two. And that's a little bit more high level. It's sometimes easier to exp express your problem in a constraint solver because you don't have to do all the bits, you know, all the nitty gritty bit details. Can I the mic? This is actually two uh, comments and just repeating the comments would be hard work for you. Um, so the first comment is, uh, well, A, I like the talk. Um, Another nice example of using a SAT solver is my colleague, Andy Gordon, 
um, who's at Edinburgh but also works at Microsoft in um, Cambridge, um, came up with another nice application. So in type systems, you often have subtyping relations. And they can just be really complicated. And he just wrote it out, the subtyping uh, relation for what he was doing as a logical formula and then dumped it into a SAT solver and that could tell you if you had subtypes. And so he took what had been a very hard problem and made it um, easy and the, there were much more flexible solutions. So there's another nice example of oh, a SAT nice. solver really for you. And that was sort of the first paper I saw using SAT solvers that made me think, oh, this is an important <laughs> they tool. They are useful. Yes, you, you, I, right. They're, oh, look, we can solve NP-complete problems and, uh, and this does it fast. Um, the other comment was <clears throat> you talked about putting things in conjunctive normal form and you did it by repeated simplification. Another way to put something in conjunctive normal form is you can say, oh, well, it's a uh, conjunction and each thing in the conjunction is a disjunction and each thing in the disjunction is a literal. It's either a variable or a negation of a variable. So you can represent it as a list of lists of literals and then have ways of combining those lists of lists. And you can say, well, or takes two lists of lists yeah. and combines them to another list of lists and so on. Um, so that's another way of computing it, which makes nice use of things like folds and maps yeah. or um, comprehension. You should build that and send me a pull request. <laughs> I've already done it. It's an exercise for our first year <laughs> students at Edinburgh in Haskell. So if you look at uh, Inf1FP at the University of Edinburgh, it's the seventh or eighth student exercise. Cool. And no, I won't send you the answer because then all the <laughs> students would get it. I, I think I can figure it out myself. Yeah, but it, it's, it's a fun exercise to do. Thanks. Oh, no, I want to ask, how long did the SAT solver actually take? Was it really a fraction of a second? That was, was really life. There, there was no editing at all. So you, you just you type it and it gives you the answer right away. Not even a couple of seconds. No, no, that was live. That was really me, a screencast typing. It, it took me longer to type. Well, obviously, it didn't t take me longer to type the whole C-sharp in the library. And it did take me longer to type the uh, mini salt input than it ran. That is actually real true. No, cool. no magic. No, uh, nothing up my sleeve. I think someone else had a question. Uh, did you violate that the g given answer is the valid state of, uh, as a result of sequence of valid steps in the game? Because you encode the board? Yes, so oh, that's, a, that's a very good question. So the question is, is it actually possible to re reach this tie? So I didn't really explain how else the game works. It just works. Um, you don't put your own pieces. Your opponent picks a piece, and then you place the piece on the board. So there are no other rules as to where you can put it or what you can do in the middle. So a state that you can reach is always possible. However, of course, I didn't do alpha, beta pruning or something. So I might need the cooperation of my partner, of my opponents, to actually get in that state because maybe they have to give me the right pieces. But it is possible to get there with just the rules of the game because the rules are of the game is just you get a piece and you place it. Good question. I've never heard that one before. It's a very good question. No, I didn't manage to do it in the evening. We, we, we did manage to reach the, reach the state in the evening, but the rewrite rules I had then were actually in a quite ugly Python hack instead of in a beautiful F-sharp library. <laughs> because that is sometimes, okay, it's nicer and quicker to do ugly code. And then afterwards I thought, oh, okay, it would be, this, it, it would be useful for a general case, so let's make a library that's, uh, also if you go to GitHub, there are two separate projects. So there's a project that makes a quarto, assignments, and there's a separate project that does all the rewriting. So I thought oh, it would just be nice to have a library where you can write in human readable format and you would get the input for Minisat and then solve it. So that I totally did afterwards. And also the parsing back, you saw that I was writing on the piece of paper. I didn't do the parsing back then because I was also somewhat fed up with it. So that was also afterwards. All in all, I think it's, I spent maybe three afternoons on it. So I gather from my colleagues who use SAT solvers that even things like conversions can turn out to be uh, surprisingly difficult. So I was looking at your code for converting to conjunctive normal form. And if I understood it correctly, then you first of all apply the distributive law, and then De Morgan, and then simplifications. But the distributive law duplicates part of the formula. 
So am I right in thinking that in the worst case, that first step might blow it up to exponential size? This is very true. That's not just because of my code. That's a, a general property that if you have a Boolean proposition that's relatively simple, if you can, if you convert it to CNF, you can always do that, but it can greatly blow up. So you can get m uh, many repeated statements uh, or just uh, statements that don't uh, add a lot, but th this is the way the conversion works. So this is very true. You can end up with CNF that's not optimal and you could, of course, run through all your clauses to see, for which I don't do, to see if you have duplicates. That will make it a bit simpler because then you don't have to do swapping on multiple. But it, it is true. That's just a property of the conversion to CNF. But maybe the simplifications that you showed, some of your equivalents has made the term smaller. So yes. maybe if you apply those first, then you might be able to avoid the problem. Yeah. Well, you will never be able to avoid the problem right. because not it's a property cases, of the term. But in not cases. in all cases, but in some cases, yes. That's right. very true. I could add some code in, in every step to see if there's duplication, if there are things that are equal that I can, uh, that I can remove to make the input a bit uh, quicker. But, yeah. And that that'll be more work, and the SAT so they're quick anyway, so they, they can deal with a few extra clauses. That's true. Any more questions? Yeah. Oh. yeah. Go ahead. You showed us the two, two tricks that uh, SAT solvers use. How many tricks a real SAT solver would use? Yeah, so there are lots of different ones that all use different tricks. So, uh, well, I'm not going to go back to the slide, but what some of them also use is restarts. You saw in the output, well, you didn't see, but in the output it also says, I did so many restarts. That's a trick as well. Sometimes they have heuristics for, well, there's so many true, uh, or there's so many false, or I had so much conflicts in the last few assignments, probably I'm on the wrong path. So they just throw everything away, they restart, and they try something else. So that is another trick that sometimes helps, is not... I didn't show it because it's not like the other two, a trick of mathematical beauty. It's more a trick of, <laughs> ah, shit, let's, tr let's try again. But there are lots of tricks. And also, as I said, there's a, a yearly, co an annual competition for the solver. So they, they are competing against each other, and not all of them are using the same trick. So there's lots more. That, uh, to answer your question, there's lots more than that I showed in this talk that you can, if you want to dive into it, if you want to participate in the competition, then there's lots to explore. Yeah, so for that, an SAT solver, it's just Booleans. But if you use a constraint solver, as I said before, then you can say, well, this has to be bigger than that. And then if it gives multiple solutions from them, you could take the minimum or the maximum or whatever, whatever you want. But I would say if you're assigning people in groups and you know that there's something that cannot happen, you will probably change the constraints before you go and transform your problem. You just say, no, you cannot express that you want to be in that group because that guy hates you. He doesn't want to be your friend. Give it up. <laughs> but you have to do it by yourself, no, not by some... Yeah, if you, would put it, if you put something in an SAT solver that's not solvable, it would just say false. False. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you have to do the transformation then before. Okay. Thanks. Thank you, Feline, for your wonderful talk and great answers.